Well, thank you, uh, Catherine. It uh, falls to me to give a very fast overview of a number of the issues. I'll do that by trying to keep it short and talking very fast, which I hope uh, doesn't lose uh, some of our non-native English speakers. Um, uh, first, uh, what a wonderful conference to uh, Adam and Jean and everyone else involved with this. Congratulations. It has been a fantastic conference. Um, for me, it is an opportunity to meet some fascinating new people and a kind of reunion with some people who I've worked with for, for decades uh, here. So it's especially sweet also to have such an interesting and distinguished panel of uh, co-panelists. And I want to pay special tribute to Catherine Marshall, who is shouldered within the bank and outside the bank in the broader faith communities, um, uh, it, uh, it, this extraordinary agenda, the relationship of development uh, work and the religious community. Um, I think she is about the only person I know who travels more than John Kerry does. Um, in, uh, she, every time I talk to her, she's in a different part of the world. Um, a really extraordinary year. So I'm uh, delighted. I'm going to give you my two punchlines. First, to leave religious, the religious community representing 80% of the population of the world in many areas, a major way that people organize their lives out of the work of development is a disaster for the achievement of sustainable development goals for uh, the work of this bank, um, uh, for the work of the communities that you represent. Um, and secondly, it is true that the World Faith Development Dialogue that Jim Wolfson helped launch um, uh, has been transformative for those who have participated in its work. It's transformative to the bank, not as much as I would like yet, but it clearly has had an impact and transformative to the religious community leaders who have been able to, um, uh, to be part of its work. Um, I really think it's time for the bank to set up a permanent entity here that deals with the uh, religious community in the development work. Adam Taylor's presence here is a start um, in that direction. I hope uh, that the kind of dialogue that's gone on can be formalized uh, here. Um, you know, religion is a fascinating entity, different than any other that I can think of um, in, in, in the life of uh, the human race across the globe. It is at once the most local, of ways in which we organize our identities, with the houses of worship, the communal entities, um, being such an important part of the day-to-day -day life in local communities all across the globe. And yet, it is the most global of communities, stretching across the globe. And in a world of uh, modern uh, communication, what happens anywhere in the globe has, uh, to that community has enormous consequences and resonance traveling around the world um, as well. Um, so at a macro level, the ability of the religious community, if it has the freedom to function the way that it dreams of functioning, the ability of the religious community to express values, to shape attitudes, to influence policies that are most conducive to the furthering and implementing of sustainable development goals is greatly enhanced. When religious communities do not have the freedom to speak out, the ability to mobilize large segments of nations across the globe on behalf of that kind of vision embodied in the Sustainable Development Goals is greatly diminished. I mean, just think of the impact of the Jubilee campaign, the influence of this pope um, on issues of poverty, on, on uh, issues of environmental uh, uh, concerns. Um, he has been a conversation changer uh, at a global level in extraordinary ways in this regard. And the ideas from uh, uh, that resonate so many of the religious traditions of the world that we have an obligation to protect God's creation, that we have a responsibility to generations yet to come, that being created in the image of God gives profound infinite dignity to every human being and a concomitant right to fulfill their potential and their destinies, the passion for peace, for reconciliation, 
All of these are indispensable for a whole range of interests that every nation that we are part of and represent um, uh, care about. The ability to combat violent extremism and to counter terrorism, the ability to uh, build democracies and enhance freedoms in general, um, the ability to provide the social services that are so necessary to meet immediate needs, and the ability to have real development that will be transformative with the goal that people will not need that direct aid any longer. All of this is enhanced by religious freedom and greatly diminished um, uh, when it is not present. And at the mid-level, religious freedom allows those um, uh, engaged in religious activities across the globe in providing services, social services, in doing development work to actually do it. There are too many countries across the world where actually religious communities themselves are banned or restricted, where religious communities are so burdened with government rules and regulations, even in, de in delivery of services, that it becomes a chilling and crushing impact that greatly restrains what they can do and what they can achieve. They're banned, they're restricted, they face all kinds of challenges um, in this regard. And these, this lack of freedom makes it impossible for them to carry out their tasks. But it's not just the freedom to act on behalf of these goals. It's also the freedom to receive them. Um, there are large, too many countries in the world in which people, because of their religious identity, because of their religious practices, because of their religious beliefs, are just shut out of governance in that country, are shut out of participation in that country, are shut out or limited in receiving um, uh, services and benefits, not just from the government, but by the government from other entities as well. One thinks of the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar and Burma today um, who are restricted in, uh, uh, in many ways from participating in this, sort of, but there are areas in Rakhine where they can't go to hospitals for core services, even private hospitals, unless it is truly an emergency. So this is an enormous challenge for us, the relationship of religious uh, uh, freedom with the uh, broader agenda of development uh, goals. And I say all of this recognizing fully the problematic impact um, that religious has, who holds different values and different views. The use of the just war theory um, uh, by some uh, uh, religious traditions in ways to justify violence, in ways that violate international law, um, that violate um, uh, the kind of consensus of many of the groups who are gathered here, um, uh, the uh, willingness to use force to impose their religious views on other people, the attitudes you indicated on women and reproductive rights that divide um, uh, religious uh, uh, communities, um, there are many challenges that we face, and where do people with differing views have a role in working on development, <clears throat> either as funded partners or non-funded partners, where they may do things that are deeply problematic in some regards, but deeply helpful <clears throat> in other reg regards. These are central challenges for us as we are um, uh, moving forward. And then we have the extraordinary work of Brian Grimm and um, uh, Professor Alone and others um, uh, trying to show the clear correlation between religious freedom and the conditions for economic growth. So, uh, and in conditions for economic growth. Um, uh, here, the cause and effect part of that, it's a fascinating question that needs to be probed further. Do the conditions that allow for economic growth are the conditions that allow for religious freedom, or does religious freedom itself um, allow for that? And I think many people know the theories. So there are clear patterns in which the ability to do development work and the entire schema of development work is going to be shaped by the religious freedom that exists in a country. The correlation that Brian and others have shown is clear, our ability to reduce corruption, to reduce violence, to enhance sustainable development is enhanced where there is religious freedom. And one way or another, 
the international community is going to have to engage more seriously, and this is a conversation I hope will enhance that, uh, uh, that process. So thank, thank you. you.